There are some baseball stars who were so good the media couldn't shut up about them. So scouts and teams went after them and paid hundreds of millions of dollars. But after they put pen to paper, their stardom soon faded into obscurity. Nobody heard of them, and the teams who got to see them play trash every day went crazy. Today we'll be looking at the worst $100 million contracts in baseball history. This list is not in any particular order. Vernon Wells could easily have become one of the greatest players to ever hold a baseball bat. He started pretty well, entering the league as the fifth overall pick in 1997 for the Toronto Blue Jays. From 2004 to 2006, he won the Gold Glove Awards consecutively and the Silver Slugger Award in 2003. After his second All-Star appearance in 2006, they blessed him with a contract extension worth $126 million on December 5th of that year. But their hopes for the star becoming even more instrumental moving forward soon crashed when he began to decline. So general manager Anthropolis quickly convinced the Angels to take him off their back in 2011. Good thing for the Jays, but bad for the Angels. Then out of nowhere, the New York Yankees got in on the mess. Things went even more sour when he became constantly plagued by injuries. His last season was with the Yankees, and he didn't even get to play for them once, but collected a $25 million salary. For Mike Hampton, it's mostly a case of ill luck, because he had had a great start to his professional career too. Two All-Star appearances, a National Wins Leader in 1999, and an NLCS Most Valuable Player Award in 2000. But after his MVP award, the Colorado Rockies gave him the largest contract of that time. On December 9th, 2000, an eight-year deal worth $121 million, which was supposed to be a steal from the New York Mets. Prior to that time, the Rockies had a rocky pitching and had hoped the star pitcher would help them break what looked like a pitching curse of the Coors Field. But it wasn't really a curse per se. Coors Field just has the problem of being the most elevated stadium in MLB. And this results in lowered air resistance, which handicaps pitches but makes hitting a lot easier. So it's said that the Rockies is a place where pitchers go to kill their careers. The deal was basically an act of desperation in the part of the Rockies, and it certainly wasn't supposed to be worth as much as it did. Nevertheless, he didn't do entirely poorly for the Rockies, but they couldn't manage him beyond two years before trading him to the Marlins. But then two days later, the Marlins traded him to the Braves. Would you consider Jason Worth an elite player? Well, in 2011, not very many people did, and who could blame them, really? He was only a World Series champion once in 2008 and had only one All-Star appearance in 2009 his only call in his entire 15-year career. However, the Washington Nationals felt differently about him. To him, he was the chosen one, so they handed the outfielder a seven-year deal worth $126 million. With a subpar career batting average of .270, one could expect nothing more than $50 million. But apparently, the Nationals didn't care. He played his last baseball with them and was honored with the Washington Nationals' Ring of Honor. Prince Fielder's nine-year contract worth $214 million would not have been the dumbest decision for the Detroit Tigers. Can you really blame a team for acquiring an informed first baseman who had just come off a stellar season? In 2011, when the Tigers gave him that huge deal, he was considered as one of the best players in the league. He had won the Silver Slugger Award, was number three in the National League MVP voting, and was an all-star. He was still under 30 and looking promising, so when he reached free agency, the Tigers splashed their biggest money on him, only to regret it later. To be fair, he started well in 2012, but his decline soon came swiftly. The Tigers could not tolerate him past 2013. So they traded him to the Texas Rangers for second baseman Ian Kinsler. Barry Zito played his best games with Oakland Athletics from 2000 to 2006 before returning to play his last games with them in 2015. He was one of those stars that peaked too early, showing signs of graduating from stardom to legendary level. Unfortunately, life happened to Zito. Well, this misfortune had nothing much to do with his earnings, though, because even when he was already declining, the San Francisco Giants embraced him with a seven-year contract worth $126 million. In December 2006, when they made the move, the owner of the Giants, Peter Magowan, even called him special and referenced Barry Bonds. 
I'd say this is the most important signing we've had since we first signed Barry Bonds back in late 1992, Magalon said. It means that much to the franchise and the future of the franchise. We don't make this kind of deal every year or every five years. It takes a very special player. Magalon had said all of that even with his stats telling otherwise. And he only got worse. His stats dropped further and the teams and the fans were getting impatient. But before he could be thrown out of the team, he shocked the world in 2012 as he was instrumental during the 2012 World Series that won the Cardinals the title. But he still makes this list because every other time since he got that deal, he was terrible and only showed vestiges of who he once was in the beginning in the 2012 postseason tournament. The Boston Red Sox had high hopes for Carl Crawford when they signed him to a seven-year contract worth $142 million, supposed to be a steal from the Tampa Bay Rays where the left fielder had excelled. Prior to that time, he was already an all-star for four years, had won a gold glove and silver slugger awards the year previous, and was a stolen base leader four times from 2004 to 2007. So it was basically a no-brainer deal. Even the Yankees had shown their interest in the guy. Sox manager Terry Francona went on the Dale and Holly show to praise him. I think he's a game changer. He's that guy that can change a game defensively, offensively. When he gets on base, he gives you a headache. He has a little bit of that Johnny Damon in him where he's swinging and I'm not sure he knows where the ball is going. But he fouls off six or seven, then he'll rifle one into right field or bounce one and beat it out. He has a way of changing the game. Frustrates the heck out of you. Sometimes you can do everything right, and if he gets on base, you can't throw him out. But boy, was Francona proven wrong. You see, some players would wait to disappoint you. This was not the case for Crawford. His first season started terribly, batting .137 and just two bases in his first two games. But Crawford had a defense for himself. He claimed the Boston environment was toxic and he was in a depression stage. So in 2012, the Los Angeles Dodgers traded him and right until his retirement, he never regained his initial form of brilliance. This might surprise you, but A-Rod deserves to be on this list. We know he's a World Series champion. We know he has three American League MVP awards, two Gold Glove awards, 14 All-Star appearances, 10 Silver Slugger awards, five home run leaders, and four American League Hank Aaron Awards. Okay, that was quite the mouthful, and there was other great achievements that highlighted his illustrious career. But listen to this. Giving him a contract extension worth $275 million for 10 years was just too much for a guy who was 33 years old already. And that's not all. He had initially opted out from extending his contract, which caused the Yankees to lose $21 million in remaining payments from the Rangers where A-Rod was traded from. And when he eventually signed the contract, the years that followed were plagued with a lot of controversies surrounding him. He could also not win any of the awards mentioned earlier and basically just struggled to keep a spot in the team. Ryan Howard was having a fantastic start to his career with the Phillies. He was nicknamed the Big Piece, was a talented first baseman who won the Rookie of the Year award in 2005. His most amazing year came in 2006 when he won the National League MVP, was called to his first All-Star, won the Silver Slugger and National League Hank Aaron Awards, and two years later, he won his first and only World Series title. So his resume looked pretty good for a big contract extension, right? Mm, not so fast. In 2010, the Phillies extended his contract five years with $125 million to go along with it. Howard was particularly excited about the deal. I'll tell you what, it's a great feeling to have that security and know where you're going to be. I feel what I've been doing over the last couple of years, I feel pretty confident that down the road I'll be right where I want to be and still doing the same things. But as the contract started in 2012, his injury woes that would go on for years also started. And when he finally regained his health in 2014, he was never the same again. So tell us, if you paid over $100 million to sign a player, but later have them not play up to their expectation, what would you do to them if trading was not an option? If you enjoyed this video about the worst 100 plus million dollar contracts in baseball history, check out the video on the screen now or the one we posted below because we're sure you'll like that one too. See you there.